This is the Dr. Berg Show. Live from the nation's capital, it's time to get healthy, lose weight, and feel great. Call now to speak with Dr. Berg at 866-561-4292. And now, Dr. Eric Berg. Hi guys, I'm back and I'm here to take your calls um, live. And the number, if you want to call in, it's 866 561 42 Nine two. Let's get right into the calls because there's a lot of them. Uh, Alejandro, you had a question about the ketogenic diet. Go ahead. You're on the air. Hey, Dr. Berg. How's it going? Good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. So I, I just had a few questions. So I've been doing the ketogenic diet for about a month now, and, you know, I really enjoy it. My only concern with it is that, so while I'm dropping weight, I notice most of it is coming off of my upper body, which wouldn't be a problem, but most of the fat in my body is stored in my glutes and legs. So my upper body is looking less proportional to my lower. So I was wondering, like, what can I do to fix this? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure most of it is uh, because, you know, while growing up, I wasn't really participating in much sports, and I was playing a lot of video games. Mm-hmm. So that's important, you know, um, that, you know, if you can answer that question for me, I'd really appreciate it. That's my first question. And then my second question is, how exactly am I supposed to use a ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting to build muscle and, like, size with two meals a day when I thought that they were both used to get lean and drop weight? Should I aim for a certain number of calories and probably do, like, 75% fat, 20% protein, 5% carbs? Uh, if not, what would you recommend? That, that's my second question. Are, are you doing two meals right now? Yeah, okay. I, I started off like at four meals. Um, I was doing a lot of different things, but uh, I tried intermittent fasting, which which has been helping. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like I like I mentioned, a lot of it the fat is coming off my upper body. How old are you? I'm um, 26. Okay, and can you give me a quick example of what you eat as one of the meals? So in the morning, I I typically have. Uh, like three eggs, bacon, um, with like half of an onion, tomato. Um, I like a lot of vegetables, really, like with broccoli too and cheese. And then like for my second meal, I'll typically have like five cups of salad or organic salad with uh, like some Parmesan cheese, ranch, organic ranch, and some chicken or steak. Okay. And I, oh, and I have uh, keto coffee too. I don't know. Okay, good. Um, and you have that in the morning, the keto coffee, right? Yeah, okay. I'm actually drinking it right now. Okay, great. All right, so let's just talk about that. There's a couple things that I would recommend. Um, you know, you're talking about um, spot reduction or kind of losing weight in a certain place. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to, you know, always lose weight where you want to lose it. It usually comes off the, usually comes off the midsection first. Sometimes it's the upper as well. Uh, you're not going to be losing muscle mass. You're going to be losing fat, but especially with women, it's like a, it's a big concern because they're losing weight in the midsection, but their, their hips are, are still the situation. The, the thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to give it more time, but you can also add some high-intensity interval training um, to the keto intermittent fasting because that will, especially if you're in lower extremity, you'll start working those muscles. Some of that uh, weight is not just fat, it's, all, it's like atrophy. Um, so that will help you greatly. The other thing, if you want to take it to the next level, is do this high-intensity full-body workout um, when in the mor- a little earlier in the morning. So now, I'm not recommending this for everyone if they have a blood sugar issue, but if you do this when you're fasting, the workout, boy, it just, it just accelerates everything. It just like almost it just sucks that fat right in it because your body is just demanding more energy so it goes after the fat reserve. Because before I was talking about having it right, right before you eat, during the meal, um, the window of eating, and then maybe just right after to have the fuel. But some people are seeing more changes if they do it in an empty stomach. You might want to try that unless your blood sugars are an issue. Um, you can always improve things too by probably that, that coffee. I would, because sometimes that uh, fat or butter or coconut in the, in the coffee can you know act like a meal so you might want to just do coffee a little cream and then nothing else and that will help you the other thing that's going to help you retain muscle protein you need and i'm going to talk about this more on the board in a little bit but you need potassium to grow muscle you need potassium to retain muscle and so 
uh, you're doing the vegetables that great, you might want to add a little bit more potassium on, as, as a supplement just to speed things up. But honestly, overall, I think you just need to give it more time and eventually it's going to go after your legs because you, your body tends to go after the midsection first or the upper body first, unfortunately. All right, thanks for your call. Hey, um, Marini, uh, I think it's Maureen from Australia. You had a question on keto and travel. Hi, Dr. Berg. I think you're awesome, and thanks so much for taking my call. Sure. I have two quick related questions about traveling overseas on the keto intermittent fasting diet. Um, firstly, I'm very happy eating this way, as the health benefits are tremendous. And although I'm not interested in having any cheat days, I will be going overseas in November, flying from Sydney to London, across to the US and flying back home from New York. Um, there'll be many hours on the plane and I would normally not think twice about fasting, but with 24 hours plus travel and transit times in the first leg of my journey alone, I will have to eat at some stage and traveling in coach, well, to be honest, the food's pretty crappy and the salads are way too small and mostly unhealthy. And so what would you recommend me do? And secondly, do you have any tips for staying healthy when flying so I don't pick up any bugs and for taking supplements? What would be the most essential supplements you recommend taking on vacation? And maybe you could do a video on this topic too. That would be awesome. Thanks again, Dr. Berg. You're welcome. Thanks. Good, good question. This is always a challenge because you're flying. The, the food on the plane is all carbs. Um, there's no, no other way than you're going to have to bring something on the plane. Um, normally, I'll go for nuts and I'll do that. Like if I'm in a situation where I'm like, oh gosh, what am I going to do? Um, usually, there's little shops that sell nuts, but the problem is that um, some of the nuts always have MSG or sugar. So I will do peanuts and I will buy a bag and I'll probably just use that as my protein. There is a good amount of protein in there. But if you have the ability to carry on some food, um, I would bring um, nuts and seeds as your basic thing. Uh, maybe even some cheese would be great too. It's hard to bring anything else. It's hard to bring a salad. But you could bring a powdered green drink. You can do the wheatgrass or just get a powdered green drink. That would be your salad because it's almost gonna, you can't bring a salad on the plane um, unless you could buy something. Now, in certain airports, um, there's, a, there's like those smoothie places, um, Jubilee, or I can't remember the name of them. I remember going up to them and saying, listen, I need to get a kale shake. And of course, they don't know how to make that. So I will say, all I want is a little bit of berries and a lot of kale and a good amount of water. And I will show them how to make it, and they'll make this kale shake, and that's one thing I'll do. But the thing that they'll do is they won't put enough water, so it becomes very, very thick and they'll put ice cubes. I want to fill the thing with water, put all the kale in there with a little bit of berries, blend it up really good, and that's, that's one tip. So you got the powdered green and you got the kale shake. And there are some restaurants that have decent salads and protein, but I would bring your own nuts and seeds and uh, just make sure that maybe like pecans would be good, walnuts, um, but I wouldn't bring bring cashews. Uh, but I, I think that's a good idea of bringing the, uh, um, uh, doing a video on that. And I think that was, I think, oh yeah, to protect your immune system. Yeah, when you get on the plane, um, there's all these people hacking and coughing and there's germs and microbes and things like that. Um, people, what will set you up for a low immune system to get a microbe would be um, like any type of stress in your environment if you're stressed out. Um, and I used to pick up every single bug um, when my immune system was low. So there are some things that you can do, not necessarily to avoid the germs being exposed to your body, but to be able to just to build up your immune system. One is vitamin D. So you can start taking vitamin D like a week before. That's really, really powerful. And then of course, vitamin C. Just make sure the vitamin C that you take is not just synthetic. Get the one with a food base, with a um, bioflavonoid mix, or just, yeah, don't get the synthetic. Vitamin C will actually um, kind of um, bulletproof you, in a sense. All right, well, thanks for your question. That was actually a good question. Hey, Jim, you're from Ohio. Go ahead, you had a question on maintaining weight on the keto. Uh, yes, Dr. Burke, thank you. Uh, I am uh, 60, 60 years old. I've got down to the weight that I want over about a two and a half month period. I actually started out with the Atkins because I didn't get find you until about halfway through. 
So I'm down to the point where I want to be. I don't want to lose anymore. Um, I've lost my belly fat. I've got about a 32-inch waist, so I feel really good about that. I'm very active, running, biking. So my question is, how do I maintain it? Yeah. I, or I'd like to still intermittent fast. Yeah. And I do that twice a day, 18 six. Um, so, yeah, how do I maintain, and does it harm me to go in and out of ketosis? Good question. Well, the whole goal, Jim, is to build up a health reserve so you're, you're not on a diet. You just are operating off these principles of, you know, low crap sugar, you know, all the junk food. Uh, but building up a health reserve over time where your system is so healthy, you can get away with an occasional going off the program and eating certain things. I mean, some people can't afford that. But uh, when you build up a health reserve, you know, you have no fatty liver, you're not on medication, every, all the indicators are good. Energy, sleep, blood pressure, all those are awesome. And then you can afford to go off of it. Um, so there's, a, there's kind of some, some gradient points from here to here as far as how much you can go off and is it harmful. Well, let's say you're doing alcohol um, a little too frequent. Well, you're just like taking that liver and you're just like whiplashing it over and over and over again. So it can create some problems. So it's really a judgment call with you. Um, as long as you're building up and you're having all the nutrition and avoiding some of these chemicals, GMO foods, I think you're going to be, you can go, you can afford to go off a little bit more. But it's, it's not harmful to continue the keto intermittent fasting over a long period of time. Now, some people don't want to lose any weight anymore. They hit their weight. Well, then just increase the quantity of food and maybe just a little bit more fat with the meals and maybe even just one more meal, maybe not. But, um, and then you'll actually, it'll, it may slow down the weight loss. Um, the other thing that you want to think about when you do this is that um, you've been doing this, I think, for two to four months, um, somewhere in between there. Um, it takes, like, you may have to do this for six months to eight months to really build up and know that you have a health reserve where you can go off more frequently, but you're just going to have to play around with it and see how, how you do. And if you go off the program, and you can monitor it by various factors like blood sugars, subjective how you feel, stress levels, uh, just quality of your cognitive function to see how much you can get away with. But I don't want to get fanatical about it, but you know, the, coal, the whole goal is to fill up your body so you don't have to worry about an occasional going off the program. Thanks for your question, Jim. Hey, Rachel, you're from New York. Uh, you had a question. Your hair is too dry. Yes. Um, actually, uh, my hair keeps breaking and splitting and getting a lot of knots. Now, I normally have elbow length hair, but within the last year I've had to cut my hair to like a mini afro. Um, and I've gone to the dermatologist, I've gone to, you know, the internist, and the most they've told me is that, you know, my iron is in normal range, it's just on the low side of that. So the last four months I've been taking iron, but I'm not seeing a difference in my hair quality. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Let's talk about that. I think, I think what you need is um, to go mainly right into more f healthy fats. Uh, the fat that I would recommend to have really good hair would be GLA, okay, gamma linolenic acid. GLA, it's from borage oil. There, you can get it from evening primrose oil and um, um, black currant seed oil, hemp oil, but get the borage oil. Um, and that should, you can get it in little tablets uh, so it's preserved and start taking that. That will help your hair a lot because those essential fatty acids um, are really good for soft, wonderful hair, prevent splitting, and for, um, for skin, skin health too. So that's the area I would go. And then don't forget to take s either consuming fish oils or the cod liver oil um, because the fats um, will, will help the dryness. It's not a dehydration, not necessarily a trace mineral, but it's the healthy fats. All right, Rachel, thanks for your call. Hey, Dan, you had a question. You're from California. Yeah, I'm quite asking about how do you add fat to the meals if the protein is not providing enough to curb the carbohydrates cravings? Does it yeah. have to be pure fat or is it just predominantly fat? Um, and what are some examples? Good question. So, Dan, yeah, because it's like even when you go out and uh, let's say you get a hamburger or you buy hamburger at the store, I mean, they sell it. It's hard to even find fattier hamburger. It's all like 90%. Um, there's one company, 
um, that you can order online. I'll actually put a link down below when I get home today. Um, that you can buy like 75% fat, which is wonderful. So the goal is to have fattier you know, meats if you're doing that. Now the other thing to add fats, I normally go, I either will make a keto bomb with, from coconut or butter and almond flour, and I have a lot of recipes online, or I'll do avocado as my fat. I do a lot of almond butter. I'll do um, like nuts, pecans. I'll do a lot of pecans. Um, I might take the uh, sugar-free chocolate chips and I'll put them in almond butter or peanut butter and that will be my fat. So you're going to have to just add more of that fat. You can do coconut oil but like what are you going to eat it straight? So you would, I would do more of a, a peanut butter type thing and that's usually going to handle your hunger over a period of time. So that's what I would do. But yeah, you're going to have to add more fat until the point where you're not hungry. Good question, Dan. Hey, uh, Jose, you're from Nebraska. Go ahead. You had a question about the adrenal formula. Yeah, um, I just found you, oh, a couple weeks ago. I had done um, some friends that told me about doing high fat, low carbs, and I'd done that for a couple of months. But the thing I've struggled with for years is um, my legs at night, and it's not um, restless leg syndrome, but I feel like the muscles on my legs are pulling off and they are very, very painful at night. Okay. And um, I don't know what I need to be doing. Okay. Good. So um, here's the thing. I, I, as far as the adrenal goes, because the adrenal affects the lower extremity in the body, the best formula is the cortisol, adrenal and cortisol support formula. That's, that would really help you. In addition to that, um, it's usually going to be potassium. So I don't know if you're doing, you've only done this for two, week, you, two weeks, so you're going to probably have to build up your potassium reserve. You can do that with the electrolyte powder that I have or, and um, a lot more vegetables. So like seven to ten cups of vegetables because without the potassium, the muscles get achy and things like that. So that's one thing. Now, if that doesn't work for some reason, here you're taking this electrolyte and it's not working, then you need more vitamin E but get a natural vitamin E complex. Okay, that should handle the rest of the majority. But there's one last thing that people do need if like uh, a small percent of the time, because I'll always try the most common thing, and then, okay, if that doesn't work, we try this. And then the last thing that you can try, if nothing else works, and this, will probably, this is the icing on the cake, is manganese. Manganese, get a chelated manganese supplement. Manganese is basically good for aching muscle and joint but it's good for disc problem. It strengthens your ligaments. So that could be an, uh, one last thing that I would use on occasion. Then boom, it's just handled. But I wouldn't go right to that first. I would do the adrenal, then potassium, and then um, vitamin E and manganese as your last option. I think that should help you. Um, hey, Angela, you're from Louisiana. You had a question about keto and yeah. heartburn. Go ahead. Yes, I've been on the ketogenic diet for about two or three weeks now, but I have a lot of past with my stomach and stuff, and I've noticed that the heartburn in my chest has been really bad, and I'm not mm. sure if it's an ulcer or not. I'm also on the road a lot. I'm a truck driver, and I've, I've looked at your videos, and I was trying to find the chlorophyll pearls, but I, mm. I can't find that. I just wanted to know what you suggested. Okay. Do you, do you, um, did you notice your heartburn is worse on the keto, or did you have it before? It's worse recently. Okay. How many meals a day are you eating? I was eating one big meal a day. Wow. Okay. Is the heartburn when you eat or an empty stomach? Uh, empty stomach. Oh, okay. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's kind of both, it's kind of both really, but it, it's constant almost. Okay. Uh, is there any chance that you might have an ulcer? Yes, it's a possibility. I've had them in the past, but I haven't been to a doctor or anything recently, so it, it's possible, yes. Okay, so let's talk about, this is, a, this is another great question. Um, let's just pretend you have an ulcer, okay? If you eat and you have an ulcer, you should feel better with eating, okay? So, like, sometimes you might feel better, sometimes you might not, but 
But if you start dumping apple cider vinegar down your throat, you'll feel worse, especially an empty stomach if you have an ulcer. So that's one way to quickly find out, yeah, I have an ulcer, I aggravate it with apple cider vinegar. But typically to get rid of heartburn, we need to acidify the stomach because if the stomach is not alkaline enough, the top valve on the top of the stomach won't close and the acid squirts up. So we have acid reflux and then we have heartburn, right? So it could be you know, the same situation where you don't have enough acid. So the thing that I would do if I were you is I would start taking the apple cider vinegar with my meals um, and see if it gets worse. If it gets worse, we know we have an ulcer, and then we have to back off that. Now we have to heal the stomach lining. And to do that, chlorophyll pearls is good. It's a standard process product. If you search standard process on Amazon, you'll find it. Um, you can probably try to find a healthcare practitioner or call the company. A bit expensive, but it's called chlorophyll pearls, um, standard process. And then you would suck on those until they're almost um, kind of real thin, and then swallow them, and it kind of just coats the entire lining of the stomach and that'll start healing it. The other thing that'll work really good, and you can get this from my site, is the, is the uh, wheatgrass juice powder. That has a lot of chlorophyll too, too, and you could take that and that starts to help heal the area, but then you can't really dump any acid down there. So you're going to have to kind of heal the system over a period of time. Once it's healed after you know a period of time, like it could take two or three, four months, then you start adding in the acid. Um, but yeah, so heartburn means that well, if you have an ulcer, that means that you've had a pretty bad health problem for a long period of time because it's, it's, to get an ulcer, you have to be pretty unhealthy. So it means you probably ate poorly. Um, but I love the fact that you're doing one meal a day. I think that over time it's going to help heal things. Um, you might have to consume as part of your vegetables more of the fermented foods to make it easier to digest. But those are some of the things that I would recommend. You might have to take more enzymes, um, too, if you can't take an acid just to help you as this thing heals. All right, good question. Hey, Megan, you're from North Carolina. Go ahead, you had a question. Low carbs make you dizzy. Uh, yes, um, I had um, some issues um, prior to this. I, um, uh, I got antibiotics, Cipro, and a whole bunch of stuff started happening to me. So um, the only thing that doctors were saying to me is that I needed to lose weight. So um, I had hair loss. I had hormone um, problems. I had um, uh, insulin resistance. I had all that. So I went on this major diet about three months ago, and I lost 45 pounds in two months. And um, all I was eating was whole fruits and whole vegetables, um, nothing in packaging. And um, I was eating some nuts and some um, peanut butters. But for some reason, I had allergy issues on top of that. It seemed like everything that I put in my body, I, my throat was itching or um, I had an ache under my right rib. So um, I did a ton of probiotics and stuff like that to try to counteract that. Now I'm able to eat the soy and other um, nuts and, and stuff like that. But before, three months ago, I wasn't able to eat any of that. Okay, do you, have you seen any of my videos on what to eat? Um, I've seen a few of them. I was wondering if there was any way that you could maybe um, do like a nutrition, counting nutrition chart for like daily, you know, use because that would be so beneficial. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I already have a lot of videos on the nutritional profiles of a lot of different foods. Um, but here's the thing, Megan. It sounds to me like you have hypoglycemia. And the thing that you're missing is a more of a dense protein, whether an egg or even an animal protein. Now, if you're a vegan, I understand that, but um, it sounds like you have low blood sugar. So when you go on a low carb and you don't have the right proteins, it's very hard to fix it. So you feel kind of like low blood, blood sugary. And, that, and insulin resistance will cause hypoglycemia. Um, I would honestly go to my site and there's a little booklet. It's very inexpensive. It's very easy to read. It's called How to Burn Fat gives you the basics of what to eat and just read that. You can read it in probably an hour, get all the basics of what you need to fulfill, all, not just the nutrition, but the macros as well. 
So you need the micronutrients and the macronutrients in the right combination. I think it's a real easy problem to solve. Um, start watching more of my videos. I probably w would do, you're going to have to fix the uh, hypoglycemia. So to do that, you don't want to do five, six small meals a day. You want to do start with three and then eventually go down to two, two meals. And I think that'll help you, but you're going to have to add more high quality protein uh, to your meals and of course some fat because the way you're doing it now, because see, one of the things is protein will increase insulin uh, a little bit, but it also stimulates an, another hormone called glucagon, which actually helps regulate your blood sugars too between meals. So you need to need more protein. So try that, Megan. I think, I think you're going to get a lot of success very fast. You'll probably just feel instantly better. Hey, William, you're from Texas. You had a question about keto and elevated cholesterol. Hey, good morning, Dr. Morning. Berg. Thank you so much for your work. Sure. Um, it's been a big impact on my life. Um, so I did blood work a couple weeks ago. I've got the numbers. Um, the good news is my triglycerides are low. Um, my overall cholesterol number is 362. My LDL is 284, and my HDL is 58. Okay. My triglyceride number was was 99. And what is it? Oh, okay, got it. All right. So, um, how long have you been on the keto? Are you on the keto? Okay. So yes, yeah. I began looking at uh, following you December first last year. Okay. And and so it's been kind of a process. Um, you know, it was like you know, I was doing it kind of like maybe like five days on, two days off, and then say beginning in the summer. Like no sugar, like sugar's gone. Um, I'm trying to think what else to tell you. Uh, are you doing intermittent doing fasting? Like, you know, are you doing intermittent yes, fasting? Yes, I'm trying to do. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to do, you know, no more than like two meals a day. And, and also, you know, observing your window, like you say, you know, start at 11 to, you know, uh, to, it may have like a, an early evening meal. Um, I guess what I wanted to tell you is I am consuming a lot of half and half and heavy cream mm -hmm. like in the morning I'll have a couple shots of espresso and then I'll have like a cup or more of half and half and heavy cream wow all organic um, so I'm just trying to figure out what your recommendations would be because I feel like I'm I'm you know feel so much healthier I've lost 30 pounds since December December 1st um, but I just wanted to see what your what you would say about those numbers okay great I think uh, overall I think you're doing great, and I, the fact that the triglycerides are going down means that you're, you can be less concerned about cholesterol. <clears throat> In fact, I, you should watch the, all the videos I have on cholesterol because I explained there's two types of LDL. One is the big fluffy, the other one is the small dense particles, and y you may just have, <laughs> as you're losing weight, you're releasing this cholesterol from the fat cells. So the LDLs are not going to be an issue because you have to have that fat come out of your fat cells, and that might just be totally normal, especially if your triglycerides are low. The biggest concern with uh, cholesterol is if the triglycerides are high, um, but you're not, I don't think you're going to have a problem. I mean, you know, if you eventually can't get the cholesterol down, then get a test to see if it's not a um, genetic issue, and then that's a whole different topic. But why don't you just try to um, maybe cut down the heavy cream, because even though it's probably grass-fed, it's probably organic, it's still pasteurized cream, and um, it's, it's, it's a lot of half and half or a lot of cream to consume. Dairy, um, I would only recommend this as small that. Try to get your fats from uh, a different source. Um, you can do nuts, peanut butter, almond butter, avocado. Um, not as much dairy and see what happens to your cholesterol. You might do better on that. Um, it is true, some people do not respond as well on dairy, especially if they have a casein allergy or a lactose uh, problem. And, and then I have them come off that. And especially if there's a diabetes type 1 or even type 2, they don't do as well with dairy. But you can do some really good grass-fed organic cheese. That would be way better than that cream. So those are the things I would do. Watch all the cholesterol ones because you're going to probably find some information that you needed to know about. All right? Thanks for your question. Uh, so then we, now we have Sue, it's Sue Jata from California. You, your mom's B12 levels are very high, right? Yes. Got it. And you're wondering 
what you can do? Yeah, I'm wondering if I should worry about it or... Yeah, there's, um, there's, a, there's a test that I would do. It's called MTHFR test, a genetic test, that your mom may have a problem with um, some, a genetic issue, uh, which relates to B12, uh, folate, folic acid, things like that. I don't want to get too into it, but I have a video on that. Uh, write down this, uh, these words, MTHFR and write that down and go ahead and watch my videos on that and then you can actually get a genetic test. If your mom has that defect, then she needs to um, change some of the foods that she's consuming, make sure there's no uh, synthetic vitamins and then start taking certain uh, types of B vitamins that are um, a little bit in a different form and that could be the uh, thing that's going to actually really help her. That's the thing that comes that's off the top of my head, so that's the most likely problem. So go ahead and try that and let me know how you do. Hey Chris, you're from Kansas City. You had a question about adrenal body type and supplements. Yes, sir. Thank you for taking my call, man. I've been watching for a couple of months. I love you and your wife. You guys are hilarious. Oh, and thanks. I, um, I've been on keto for about two months. Mm -hmm. I ordered your adrenal pack. I've been on it for about uh, a week now. I also ordered the gallbladder formula. And I also have picked up um, milk thistle. And so I'm adding this because I've been suffering from indigestion, lots of belching uh, since I was about 17 and I'm 43. Wow. So I was wondering, um, I was wondering, uh, for, well, for one, I've, I've had a tremendous stress over those years. Um, and I've been trying to lose uh, weight forever. Me and my wife have been doing keto for about seven months. We do a lot of um, weight training mixed with uh, cardio right now. And I haven't dropped a lot of weight, but I've been dropping body fat percentage um, and gaining a lot of muscle. Um, so my question is that, how do I know what taking that adrenal pack with the gallbladder thing, uh, gallbladder uh, pill and also milk thistle, how do I know exactly what's working? And also the keto makes me a little bit, have a little bit of more indigestion, which I think is the fat, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, Kind of what's your suggestion with that, which, with already being on keto for a month and a half? Yeah, good question. Are you doing intermittent fasting? Not really. Okay. I mean, no, I don't, I don't kind of, because I don't start eating until about 1.30 in the afternoon. We work out fasted, but I don't, um, I, I'm kind of eating until about 11, because I'm a musician, so I'm up till 11 and 12, 1 in the morning sometimes. Okay. So Chris, there's things that are really, really, really important and there's stuff that's kind of lesser important. So I just want to talk about the most important thing. Um, the adrenal package is exactly what you need for the stress. So you could um, take those as recommended, <clears throat> but there's something probably a little more important to talk about. Uh, you need um, something that may not be in those supplements right now. And that would be um, the uh, digestion formula, which is the apple cider vinegar plus, because that has in it two things, apple cider vinegar pills with betaine hydrochloride in a 50-50 ratio. <clears throat> you probably would benefit from like, like right now, probably five of those before a meal. And the reason for that is because uh, indigestion, stomach problems are really, it's a lack of pH and stress will deplete that and over time as you age it'll go down. Um, that will give you the most improvement. You can't even release bile without a strong acid in your stomach. So, so you may or may not feel better initially with the um, gallbladder. So you want to test it out. But once you fix the stomach, you will. But you want to take the gallbladder after the meal. And in the meantime, before you get that, you can take, um, start taking more apple cider vinegar. Two tablespoons in some water before each meal. Okay, And then take one before you go to bed. That'll start to acidify that stomach. That'll probably make the biggest difference, okay? That's number one. Number two, um, the intermittent fasting is probably the biggest thing that you're missing now and the most important thing that you want to plug into this formula, especially for you because if you actually don't eat for a period of time and you, let's say you eat at one, a really good meal, and then have another one and that's it, no snacks, and add more fat as needed, you're going to give your system such a chance to drop that insulin and lose so much more weight, but more important than that is to you're going to give the gallbladder and your digestion a sense to reset and rest and recover just like you would if you worked out. And that's going to be the 
your saving grace because that's going to really help reset the digestion because people that don't do intermittent fasting, it just puts a lot of stress on the digestion so it never really heals. And the gallbladder have a chance to concentrate its bile. So then when you do eat, boy, you have all this amazing bile to digest all those fats in that food. So simple problem, bite the bullet, focus on the intermittent fasting within the next month or so. See if you can do gradually just two meals and watch the improvement's going to just be off the charts. All right? Good question. Hey, Joe, you're from Texas. You had a question about uh, a few things. Uh, go ahead. You're in the air. I can't really see what you're asking, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes, I had a question about HSV 1 and 2, like if you had any supplements. I saw you uh, had a video about chia seeds and, and that uh, deal right there, and I was wondering if you could talk more about it. I'm also taking L-lysine. L-lysine? Yeah. L-lysine, yes. Now, HSV, what? Yeah, that's the, that's the herpes simplex. Oh, uh, okay, okay, two. got it, yeah, got it, okay. Good question, so let's just talk about the best thing for herpes. Well, that's really a viral thing. So there's a couple things we can talk about viruses to put that virus back on the mission. The thing that just pops out right away is the vitamin D. So either sun or actually in a supplement, D3. Start taking that D3. That's going to actually put that thing back in remission. The other thing is you need is trace minerals. There's a plant-based trace minerals um, that you can get um, that you take in liquid and you start consuming that. That'll help this virus too. And then in addition on top of that, you need to do all the recommend recommendations that I'm recommending with keto and intermittent fasting because that's going to lower your insulin. That's going to keep your virus in check. You can't kill a virus. So you, all you can do is keep it in remission. So L-lysinine is okay, but it's not um, nearly as powerful as keeping your insulin low, doing the keto and intermittent fasting, which is what we're talking about today. And I think that will um, protect you. So the thing about viruses is as long as you stay healthy, you're going to be fine. So your goal is just to be super healthy. Thanks, Joe. So Mark, you're from Kentucky. You had a question. Your grandmother wants to get off this uh, warfarin or Coumadin. Yes, sir. And first of all, I just want to say that you've been a huge impact on not only myself, but my entire family. And my, me, my girlfriend, my mother, my stepfather, all of our friends, my grandmother, all of us have been following you for probably the last eight months. Awesome. And we've all seen wonderful, wonderful results. My mother is completely off diabetes medication. She just stopped probably three weeks ago and has not had to take a drop of insulin since. Wow, that's great. So uh, really, really amazing stuff. Uh, but for my grandmother, her doctor keeps going back and forth with her about um, her blood thickness. You know, she has to go once a week if it's too thick. If it gets better because she increases her apple cider vinegar intake, uh, then they say, oh, well, your blood's great. You can eat, you know, uh, or you can, we can drop this back a little bit. But she loves salads, and we want to eat, you know, more salads. And I keep telling my grandmother, you need the nutrition from all of your greens. But uh, her doctor is just adamantly opposed about her taking in what would be good for her so that they can continue to keep her on warfarin. So she's taken probably about 10 tablespoons of vinegar per day to try and do what the warfarin's doing. But because she has that leaky valve and the uh, prolapsed uh, heart, um, she needs to... Uh, she needs to do something different. So I was wondering, do you have a recommendation so that we can finally get her off this warfarin? Yeah, good question. First thing, I want to make a little disclaimer. Anything I say is for educational purpose. Check with your doctor before taking my recommendations. Okay, got that out of the way. Now let me just give you some education, to something to research. I recently did a video. I did release it on vitamin B4. You should watch that. that um, that's a nutritional yeast, and that actually helps tone the heart and, and helps with murmurs and helps uh, leaky valves and things like that. Uh, most people are taking the Coumadin to thin the blood. It's, 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 like, it, it's like a rat poison. It kills, kills rats, but they, it blocks the um, clotting factors, which is vitamin K, K. And then what happens is that usually you take it if you have atrial fibrillation because you don't want to develop a clot. You should also watch the recent video on preventing TIA because I talk about the nutrition that will help with that. Um, I think if we go deeper, you need to focus on the real reason why she has a leaky valve, and that would be the B vitamin. So 
Yes, apple cider vinegar is important, but probably more important is nutritional yeast. That's the thing that I would recommend, nutritional yeast. So you get the B vitamins to help that area. The other thing as far as thinning the blood naturally, uh, vitamin E will do it, a natural vitamin E, okay? And uh, the fish oil, so a real good virgin cod liver um, oil, uh, not, yeah, cod liver oil, virgin cod liver oil, that would actually be very good to thin the blood. So those are all things that you can look at. And in the meantime, for vegetables, I did a video on Kumatin, you, and I actually gave a list of all the vegetables that she can have, you know, like yellow vegetables and orange, so you can have more of those right now. Make a salad out of that, and I think that would actually help her as the transition to kind of correct the initial reason why she needs, she's on in the first place, okay? All right, cool. Hey, Nick, you're from Texas. You had a question. Yes, sir. And like everyone else, I want to start by saying thank you. I mean, I've been doing this for about two months, the keto diet, and without your information, I mean, I would not be nearly where I'm at right now. So really thank you for all your help. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think you've been saying you know, all the advice, and it's been working out great for me. Um, I've lost... Uh, uh, Unfortunately, Nick, you're breaking up. I don't know what's happening, uh, but uh, I tell you what, Nick, um, maybe you can email me that question at Dr. Berg at Dr. Berg, Dr. D R B E R G at D R B E R G dot com. Unfortunately, you're breaking up, and I wanted to hear that question, but I think it has something to do with uh, keto diet and too much protein. So, um, so let's just. I'm just going to guess at what you're asking, and then I'm going to go to the board, and I'm going to. Talk about protein in general. Um, in fact, let me just go to the board and talk about that now because I think that'll actually help. All right, <clears throat> so too much protein. <clears throat> so there's a couple points on protein that you need to know. We have the amount of protein, so you don't want to go more than six, three to six ounces. And the reason for that is that anything more will spike insulin, okay? So we want the quality, but people are concerned about, well, I need to keep my muscle mass, I need to do this. Well, did you realize that the mineral that actually will help your muscles be retained and grow, because it's, I'm not just talking about becoming bodybuilders, but I'm talking about, um, <clears throat> like if you have atrophy, let's say you're menopausal and you have atrophy of the muscles, like you're female or men, and you want to get this muscle back, this collagen, uh, not just muscle, but all proteins, hair, nail, skin, ligaments. The main thing that people need is potassium. If you're potassium deficient, <clears throat> you cannot make your muscles grow, okay? You'll have, you won't be able to get, you know, big if you're trying to actually get more muscle mass, and you won't be able to get rid of the atrophy. So all these, like, athletes that are, especially bodybuilders are taking all this protein, like massive quantities of protein, and they don't have enough potassium, they don't get anywhere. So potassium acti is involved in almost every single enzyme of protein synthesis where you take amino acids into protein. So we need potassium in that. And then secondly, look at this. We got the, we have insulin is the key Here's the, here's the door. Insulin is a key that controls protein in the cells. So without insulin, you can't get protein in the cells to make body tissues and protein. So if you have insulin resistance, pre-diabetic, like most people, um, you're, not, you're gonna have a protein problem. So to lower the need for insulin, to fix insulin resistance, guess what you need? Potassium. Interesting. So you need 4,700 milligrams. Now, if you're a, um, you have rheumatoid arthritis or you have really bad adrenals or some type of inflammatory condition, you're going to need probably 6,000 milligrams, okay? And bananas don't cut it. You're going to have to get them from vegetables. So even at um, some vegetables, even if you did six or uh, seven to 10 cups, you're still, not, you're still going to be short of potassium unless you have real quality vegetables, avocados, beet leaves, kale, things like that. 
And that's why I always recommend a couple times a week, you know, do your kale shake with a lot of these other greens in there. Put the other greens in there. Don't just have like a low quality, like a Caesar salad type, you know, iceberg lettuce or just romaine. You need like a lot of other stuff in there. So we need a lot of vegetables and you can even enhance that with electrolyte powder. I have a really good electrolyte power just with potassium citrate. It has a thousand milligrams per serving. You can add that in there just to put the icing on the cake. No, don't talk about icing. So, so we have that, okay? Then we have certain, um, the hormones that are involved in protein synthesis. We have growth hormone, we have glucagon. Growth hormone is the anti-aging hormone. It is the hormone that preserves your muscle protein and all your protein. And so the goal is how do we trigger growth hormone? Well, <laughs> heavy exercise, short duration, high intensity, okay? Exercise. Sleep will do it. Intermittent fasting will do it. Lowering your stress will do it, okay? Glucagon will also be triggered by heavy exercise and intermittent fasting as well, and moderate amount of protein. So we need that moderate amount of protein. We don't want too much. Um, so we have the, the diet, but um, you, know, you may f find that you're consuming enough potassium in your diet, but your stomach acids are low. So you might have low acid. As you age, you decrease your stomach acid, and then you can't absorb the uh, potassium, the minerals, and you can't break down protein. So that could be another uh, common cause, especially some of the callers today we're talking about. They have heartburn and digestion. I think they have low stomach acids. So even if you have an ulcer, you have low stomach acids. We don't want to add acid in there. At first, we have to heal it. Then we need to reacidify. So you can start absorbing protein and minerals, okay? Another common cause of potassium deficiency is diuretics, especially thiazide. Uh, thiazide, it's called. Um, a diuretic um, basically will deplete your ele electrolytes, specifically potassium, and people take diuretics to lower blood pressure. Well, guess what? If you deplete your potassium, guess who you end up with? High blood pressure because potassium lowers blood pressure. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, let's go back here. I just wanted to kind of cover some things there and um, come right back here. So, Jennifer, you had a question. Uh, you're from South, actually, South Dakota. You had a question on keto and body odor. Go ahead. Hi, yes. Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I believed I had struggled with insulin resistance and finally had the lab work done a couple months ago that confirmed it. Um, and one thing I've noticed over the last couple of years, particularly as I um, sit at my office by the end of the day and over the last several months, I've noticed an increase in body odor. I don't really notice it at home or while I'm doing activity. It's just at the office. And it's embarrassing because I, I deal with the public and a lot of people. Mm, yeah, okay. Okay, so there's a couple things that um, you want to make sure of. And, and out of all the things I'm going to talk about, uh, some of these might not apply, but just these are potential reasons you have body odor. In the transition, in the keto adaptation to burning fat, there will be some release of ketones in the urine and other parts of your body that could be coming out. And that means um, that the ketones sometimes have a certain odor to them. That could be one thing, could be from the breath or whatever. But um, that's only in the keto adaptation. As you do keto for a period of time, that goes away because you start becoming more efficient and you're burning up all the ketones, so the odor goes away. But in the transition, that might be the fact. So you have to be careful about too, consuming too much protein. Okay, that's number one. So don't have any more than you know, six ounces. You might even do better with five ounces or even four ounces. So just check that. And then the other thing is you want to start increasing the quantity of vegetables to the diet to start countering some of the waste product from the ketogenic diet. It's a different, different waste product. So start beefing up that. And then the other thing that I would recommend is, um, uh, kind of double or triple the dosage of the wheatgrass juice powder. And the reason for that is it's a, it's a good deodorizer. It's a good cleaner. It has a lot of chlorophyll. 
and that is the thing that you need to kind of counter that odor. Um, I just did a video on, I think it was like stinky urine, but you can actually watch that because that would also apply to the odor. Um, but you really need to kind of adjust what you're doing. It's, it's either you're doing too much, too much fat or too much protein, okay? So lower that and then increase more vegetable and I, until that odor goes away. Thanks for your question, Jennifer. Hey, Greg, you are from Virginia. Go ahead. You had a question about uh, something. Yes, I had a question about Pyrone's disease. I was wondering, can you tell me the, the plaque of the fibrous the tissue that builds up in the penis area, is it something that can be resolved without having an operation? Yeah. Honestly, Greg, yeah, I've never, um, I don't have enough experience to tell you um, how to address that, honestly. Um, but I can just tell you offhand, plaquing in general is usually a, a protein issue, a fibrous issue, and um, so it may not pertain to your problem, but in general, there's a lot of uh, fibrous tissue, extra protein plaquing that can grow in different parts of the body. And the absolute best remedy for that is an enzyme called serapeptase. You can look it up. You want to get it in at least 150,000 IUs. Take it on an empty stomach. And that's one of the best things to kind of clean up and remove uh, fibrous plaquing throughout any part of the body that shouldn't be there. It's great for cirrhosis as well. Okay, Greg? Thanks for your question. Uh, then we have another question um, from Tanzina. Let's see, no, it's actually Yaz Yao from Tanzania. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Hello, Mr. Bug. Hi. Um, how are you? Good. How are you? Um, thank you for uh, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, I'm from Tanzania, and uh, my question is. Uh, my body is very slim, and uh, I decided to do uh, ketogenic diet because I have a, a problem of belly fat. But if I take ketogenic diet, I become more slim. So I would like to have uh, your suggestion on that. Okay, so you have keto flu? Sorry? You said you had keto flu? No, no, no. I have a belly fat. Oh, belly fat. Got it. Yes, and uh, I tried to do a ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. but it makes me more slim. Okay, got it. So yeah. here's here's the here's the thing about the keto. Uh, honestly, the keto is one tool to use to help weight loss because you're lowering carbs, and that's really good. And uh, some people get great results from that. There's other tools that you can use. One is intermittent fasting. So I would go for that. That's even a more powerful tool than keto. So I would go to three meals, no snacks, two meals, no snacks, and maybe even one meal. If you can do it, if you really have a slow metabolism. <clears throat> the other tool that you can add to it is addressing uh, the eating plan based on your body type. In the new book I'm releasing, I actually even talk about that. So we're combining a bunch of strategies. It's the combination of powerful strategies that help people get healthy versus why, why just use one? And then we can add high intensity interval training as another tool to get healthy. We can also provide all the nutrients for your uh, basic requirements. That's another tool. Um, we can also get rid of body problems. That's another tool. But for you, I think I would focus on the intermittent fasting because that's what you're missing. And that would take you to the next level. Uh, especially if you're trying to lose belly fat, because that, if you have belly fat, all that means is you have too much insulin. Okay, you gotta drop it. Intermittent fasting is the most powerful tool. But thanks for thanks for calling. Uh, okay, so now we have another question from Jeron from Tennessee. You had a question, electrolyte uh, formula question. Oh yes, um, yeah. I was wanting to know uh, does. It uh, your electrolyte powder, does it have caffeine in it? Oh, good question. Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, that's a, you know, there's so many drinks out there. There's energy drinks, five-hour energy drinks, which has like between 215 and 245 milligrams of caffeine. I mean, the caffeine alone will, will rev up your adrenals 
and create all sorts of problems since you have the monster drinks and all these other things. <coughs> so, no, mine has no caffeine, it has no sugar, and it also has no maltodextrin, which is, has the highest glycemic index of anything. So, um, I, had to I had to make sure that, I mean, it's such a routine thing that uh, manufacturing companies use in formulas that I had to say, no, I don't want any of that crap. So, it's, uh, you're just getting these minerals in a good form. Uh, it's flavored with stevia, okay, which is totally fine and a little natural flavoring, which is awesome. So when you take it, you'll actually, you won't have any like weird aftertaste or anything like that. So it's very good tasting. So, good question. Hey, Mohammed, you're from, um, <clears throat> you're on the air. You had a question about keto and liver enzymes. You're from Kuwait. Yeah, Dr. Berg. Uh, well, I've been following you and your videos are really great. Uh, two weeks, two years ago, I was really on form and I lost a lot of weight. And uh, family reunions, weddings, etc., just got me back on it again. I'm on my carbs. It's been about a year again, and it's really hard for me. I see it very hard to get back on keto. This is number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I have been uh, propagating about the keto diet to my friends, to families, and to extended people that I meet in general. And I have been telling them about this, and there are some people with medical background, they do stop me, tell me, what about your liver enzymes? What have you checked your liver enzymes? So I'm really confused. Um, and I just recently watched your video about uh, uh, the video on, I'm, I'm sorry, the yeah, your video on uh, uh, what the heck or what the, what the hell about what the hell? food. Yeah. And uh, that's, yeah, well, that's where they're promoting um, Surprisingly, promoting saying that carbs are not not if carbs are good for you, and in the other hand, fat fat are bad. So, just wanted some insight on what do what do they mean when they mean saying liver enzymes, and and how how am I supposed to test for liver enzymes over here? Yeah, good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, first of all, um, I will guarantee that whoever said that doesn't understand keto. What they're what they're doing is they're mixing up or confusing the keto diet with another condition called ketoacidosis, which is a diabetic type 1 problem. You don't have diabetes type 1. So you can do nutritional ketosis very healthily and not have any issues. Keto diet takes stress off the liver, okay, especially if you're doing it like I'm saying with all the vegetables. So they just don't understand it. So you're when you get opinions from people who don't understand something or are not expert in it, you're going to get the most wild opinions. It's kind of like going to a medical doctor for nutrition advice. Well, do they have any training at all? Well, they have biochemistry training, but not in the area of nutrition. They don't have it, especially with these diets too. So um, go to them for medical conditions, but when you go into keto, I wouldn't even bring it up because they're going to just give you their confusions on what they think it is and how bad it is and whatever. Uh, I mean, think about it. If everyone went on keto and intermittent fasting and started losing weight and got off their medication, guess who's going to lose a lot of money? The pharmaceutical companies, the food manufacturing companies. So um, you really have to um, get your own first-hand knowledge, not second-hand from someone who doesn't even understand it. But the bottom line, it's the best thing for your liver because it's you're actually stripping fat off the liver. You're improving enzymes. You're getting off sugar. I mean, just let's take the opposite. Let's take a diabetic who has, is living off of sugar fuel. Look what happens to their liver, fatty liver. Look what happens to their kidney. They end up with, um, on dialysis. So, again, it's just someone that, it's like you can take it with a grain of salt. They don't even understand. In fact, what I like to do is I like to say, oh, okay, so um, what part of the keto diet uh, will affect the liver negatively. What, what's the function of insulin? You're going to find out some of these experts don't even know what it is. Now that documentary on what the health um, is complete utter BS because what they're talking about is the you can, you can eat sugar, you can have sugar, and in fact you can improve diabetes with eating sugar. I'm like what, what planet are you living on? It's absolutely not true. And so if that's true, then everyone that's eating sugar, they should keep eating sugar because it's going to improve your diabetes and come off the saturated fats. That's why I'm doing live Skype calls with all these people that do this eating plan and you can see what happens to their blood sugars, their cholesterol, their diet. I mean, I'm getting 
tons of them and you can watch them. And some people say that's anecdotal. These are real people, you know, versus a study. I don't want to get into the study wars with people because they, they're not even interested in listening to opposing sides. They already have their mind made up. So honestly, I would only bring this up with people that are willing to learn something new and don't have fixed ideas. All right? Hope that helped. Okay, so then Yvonne, you're from Texas. You had a question. You're our last caller. <coughs> yes. Hello, Dr. Burke. How are you today? Hi, good. Well, my question is I have atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. and uh, I was just wondering, I hate this medication that the doctor has me on for this. I was just wondering if it was something else I could do to improve this. Yeah. or to get off this medication because I've been doing intermittent fasting now for about two months and I feel great. The only medication I have is for this AFib. Is there anything that I could do to help this along? Yeah, good question. <clears throat> the research that you want to go into to study more, uh, to get more knowledge on is electrolytes and specifically potassium and even magnesium but mainly potassium and atrial fib. There's a whole lot of research done by the medical community on this of just increasing more potassium to correct atrial fib. I mean, think about what the electrolytes do. They support the nerve and muscles, okay? Now, the pacemaker of the heart that controls the rhythm of the heart, the muscle of the heart um, will fibrillate when it doesn't have electrolytes, specifically potassium. So um, we need so much potassium and it's, if you go to the doctor and get your potassium checked and it comes out normal, they're just checking the, the potassium in the blood. Normally, 98% of all the potassium is in the cells, not the blood. So unless you do an intracellular potassium test, you'll never see these deficiencies. So you can get an intracellular potassium test if you want just to confirm that and show that you're low, or you can just start taking more potassium, a lot more vegetables, and that eventually will improve that. But that's the area you want to go. There's even some great books on atrial fib and potassium um, that I would go into studying that until eventually you can come off that stuff. Hey, guys, you guys had some wonderful questions. I, I'm excited about um, you know, your interest and your great compliments. I want to thank you. So um, I'm doing a convention for the next few weeks. So until then, keep watching my videos because I'll release two a day. And have a wonderful weekend. Thanks much.